Hey everyone, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I waited for Dawson to take a big gulp before I started uh, recording. Uh, guys, this is going to be a great episode. One, uh, a long time coming. Dawson and I have been talking about theology of weakness. We've been talking about uh, an accurate view of anthropology, those kinds of things. It's going to be an exciting episode. You guys, stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Guys, I'm very excited. Like I said, theology of weakness is something that, man, isn't talked about enough. Uh, but before we dive into our subject matter, I want to encourage you guys to check out ways to support the ministry. If you aren't supporting the ministry right now, just remember we're entirely crowdfunded. There are links in the description, both on PayPal and Patreon, where you can help uh, support the ministry. One-time gift uh, on PayPal or a continual gift as low as five bucks a month on Patreon helps us keep the lights on. Uh, man, y'all don't get to talk to Dawson. Y'all don't get to see Dawson often uh, because Dawson is too busy making us look good. Uh, Dawson writes study guides. Dawson puts a bunch of research together for Remnant Radio. When we do episodes uh, and we don't read the book, Dawson compiles thousands of years of Christian history into 22 page documents that we can read prior to a show. Uh, man, and then he does all the blogs for us. He does all of the uh, uh, study guides for you guys in the links of most of our most of many of our videos uh, that have heavy theological topics. He does a lot of the leg lifting so that you guys can continue your research uh, because he is really occupied with family and work and those kinds of things. He's not often with us here on the show, so so I get the honor of once again introducing you to the man, the myth, the legend, Dawson. Hey y'all. So man, tell us. How's it been in, in your world? Oh, it's been good. Baby's getting older. Less diapers. Less diapers? Less diapers. I'm happy with that. Um, things are going well. I, I just uh, just got to see my parents a couple of months ago. I met your um, little one for the first time. Yeah, I know. He's growing, isn't he? Yeah. Oh, man. But um, things are going really well. Yeah. yeah that's good stuff. So uh, today, Theology of Weakness. Yeah. Why are we talking about it? Uh, because it's really important because we uh, some of the things in, uh, in the church today— um, deal with heavily with a theology of weakness. I think it's one of the uh, issues that needs to be understood and then lived out um, to see a healthy church culture, and more importantly, a healthy ministry culture. Uh, we don't have um, very healthy cultures in that way. There's a posture, especially in America, of strength that um, that really cuts us off from living in the kind of power God wants to give us. Um, both, both to become more holy and to become better witnesses. And I don't believe we're, we're really tapping into that in a way we should because we don't understand how he wants us to operate. And when you say posture of strength, you know, when I think of I mean, when I was in small town country church, and these are just caricatures, this isn't true of every place, but mm -hmm. like small town country church, a posture of strength looked like I don't touch sin right? I'm holier than thou. I'm better than you. I'm better than everyone. I want to posture my holiness. And bigger, I don't do the five, the five things. I don't yeah. drink or chew or go with girls who do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, those are my three. I don't know. The, the gold, the girls, the glory, you know, I'm better. That, that kind of like holiness thing. Right? Exactly. But, but in the bigger metropolitan areas, like this posture of strength is I want to be leading the church in pastoral ministry or discipleship or something. Yeah. So I've actually got to posture myself and pretend like I am the authority on all things academic, or I have mm -hmm. to I have to flex on my strength. Maybe there's some morality there as well, but I've also got to 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 flex on. Uh, man, I've got everything in order. My my family's always put together. My my home is always put together. My car is always put together. And even though it's not that way, I'm trying to create this appearance mm -hmm. that I'm a good and strong leader. That's what posturing strength looks like in my context. Can you think of? posturing of strength in different contents where people are trying to make themselves more than they are. And what you're getting at is, is those issues of those issues of uh, you in posturing, you're presenting something that isn't really there. It's an image. Yes. A it's facade. a facade. Um, yeah. A persona is, is the term. I, I like, uh, it's a Jungian term, but it means to, uh, to put on a mask uh, and present a different person. Uh, and you're putting on a persona that, you know, uh, 
gets you what you want. It's Whether, literally the definition of a hypocrite, right? Like in, in some extent, the old yes. forms of yeah. art, a hypocrite was a person who played two roles, but they would yeah. put on a mask that was happy to take that off and they put on a mask that was sad and they play both roles. Yes. And a hypocrite in the church is just a person who pretends like they're more righteous than they are or smarter yeah. than they are. Not yeah. a popular thing. Not a popular yeah. thing. Being and, and for me, coming from a Southern culture, being pretentious is... It, whether it's the form that uh, looks like you have it all together right. or it's the form that looks like you're the holiest in the room. Uh, both are pretentious masks. Both both are ways that in Jeremiah would say uh, is secor, is something that is falsely lived. Uh, and we just don't need that. Uh, it's It produces a, a vain triumphalism that is just not indicative of what God wants of the church. Well, let's hang out on vain triumphalism because I think when we talk about posturing strength we as christians we know that that's wrong and we also can see how that's a detriment to the gospel right mm -hmm. one of the that uh, when they ask people hey do you think christ is a good teacher is a moral guy they're like yeah we like christ we love christ he's great but the christians they're all hypocrites it's like the number one accusation against the church according to barnett yeah. they're hypocrites right um so we understand how that negatively affects the gospel message and our and our witness uh, but when we talk about vain triumphalism this is an actual belief system because I think deep down we know we're not all together, but we just can't stop living with our own pride. We can't stop. We can't. We can't repent of our pride. We can't repent of our our self importance or whatever that is in the eyes of other people. But vain triumphalism is like I can actually do it. Yeah. So there's two sides of the different of a different coin, right? Like yeah, one and, is self deluded. And when when another thing that gets to that is we live in a culture that pushes us towards both um, those kind of beliefs that are not real. Uh, like you said, I mean, because it's not real. Everybody knows they sin. That's right. But so it's not real to 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 live in a kind of well. I can do this. This is the ideal. It's a confusion of what a, a moral ideal is, uh, which is meant to be something that is unattainable, but uh, but something you aspire to, uh, mm -hmm. versus something that no, I can live this and I will live this, uh, and and if and if I fail, I'm only going to let. Uh, you know, no one see that I fail because look at Facebook. Facebook is a great example. Absolutely. What do you put on Facebook? You put on Facebook the books that you want people to think you've read. You put on Facebook the things that you or Instagram. You put on Instagram the uh, the life you want people to think that you're living. Um, and it is a true example of how how our culture has molded itself into an image based project who who I am based. And who I really am either has no has no bearing. Mm -hmm. And this is something that is this cultural motif has affected the church deeply. Mm -hmm. And and we have to we have to come to terms with it because what it's done is it's cut us off from understanding what scripture calls us to be as just true people who who embrace who we are in our in our in our sinner and our saint, uh, who really understand. Uh, that yes, I am a tr I am a real sinner, and be able to say those those and talk about those issues, or even talk about our weaknesses, our natural weaknesses, without uh, without feeling derision. Um, it, you know, the, I guess the term safe space. You know, the church needs to be a place where they, you can have vulnerability and transparency, and sometimes you have that in the pew, and you can have churches that are mighty that that. They'll talk about how their home groups are just just places of safety and, and people can be transparent and vulnerable. And that may be very true. But because there's two cultures in every church. That upper echelon of leadership ain't that, that transparent. There is no transparency up there because mm -hmm. there's two cultures in every church. Two, and, two, and both cultures have to be held to the same standard. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, what are, you know, there's trouble is, is, the, is the problem. Um, so, and I, go ahead. Yeah, so we've got vain triumphalism. Uh -huh. We've got this like posturing where it's like, hey, I, I want to appear strong. A culture of image. A culture of image. This all is rooted into like we get the glory, mm -hmm. right? Because I want to I want to have the glory because I want to look good in front of people. And also I want to believe that I can actually obtain glory. Like vain triumphalism is like, how do I obtain this healing, this breakthrough, this, this sinlessness, this position, yeah. this whatever? How do I achieve it? This is... And when I say this phrase, Dawson, D Dawson has like this, this, this inner witness that cries out like this vain individualistic, you know, like he just, he just, rec he receiving it. Glory. Right. Because, right? because it is, 
it is more invasive than materialism. It is more yes. pervasive in the way that it's affected the, the, the church culture than entertainment. The idea of individualism post enlightenment is like it is the bane of your existence, that, right? Like it is it is everything that you hate. <laughs> it's like, it's I wouldn't like be a, that it's strong. Like, it's like it's like, it's like yeah. this this scene uh, in the office where where Michael Scott is cornering Toby and he goes, "Why do you choose?" No, no, yeah. What is it? Why do you choose to be all the things? No, why do I hate so much of what you have chosen to be, or all the yes. things that you have chosen to be? And it's like when we, me and Dawson, can be talking about any theological topic, and then he goes, <laughs> "You know what it comes down to? Individualism. This, this individualism is radical libertarian free will individualism. Like every time, it's one of those things. So uh, it's my hobby horse. Un yeah. Unpack where this came from and why this is a cancer not to be played with." Like this is a serious threat. This is an issue in the church, not just yeah. like, oh, you know, you know, we got some room. We got some room. We could we could do better in this. But like this is dangerous and it needs to be cut out like a cancer. The reason the reason is um, because a radical understanding of rugged, like rugged individualism, a radical understanding of it uh, is this idea two sided. One is that it's rooted in an autonomy that promotes works. Mm hmm. And the second is it's it's rooted in a lack of authority, well, a self-authority, uh, a self-absorption that it promotes. So it promotes a self-absorption that leads to, to um, dismissing all authorities that you don't authorize. Mm -hmm. So who's the authority if you have to, if you're never submitting, if there's no submission in, in anything you do, but you're always authorizing, mm -hmm. then you have no authority structure but your own. Mm -hmm. And then the second is, like I, like I said to begin with, it, it promotes, kind of, and what it produces is, um, to kind of move forward, what it produces is it produces kind of this, in the early 20th century, it produced kind of a John Wayne ruggedness. Mm -hmm. um, a, um, I must appear perfect so that I can maintain power. Mm -hmm. um, and in leadership, the worst thing you can do is to, in the wrong way, try to look like Jesus. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is to try to look like the divine divinity of Jesus. Yeah, because if you, I mean, if you confess that sin, if you express this weakness, even if it's not sin, let's let's talk about because well, we don't we don't want to conflate those terms. Those what about what you issues? said uh, earlier? What you said about a uh, about um the example with the the guy that told you about eating? Okay, yeah. So. Uh, I cannot confirm or deny where this took place just because of the sensitiveness of the, because I'm throwing this guy under the bus if I mentioned uh, who they were. Um, man, the... the well, yeah, he, let's just talk about the idea. They, they yeah. yeah, so they would not eat in public because um, it humanizes you in front of people. Um, to eat with people is to show them physically that they are like you. That, that if I eat with you, then that means that I'm like you and that I have to be sustained the same way that you are sustained. But to have this image of um, strength, you, you must have to be self-sufficient, mm -hmm. right? So I'm literally hearing an individual explain to me why they don't eat in public and they don't eat in the naked eye. And like we were confronting this person who's really, like, I don't know, you know, like you eat, right? Like what's like, why is it that, you know, we've been working with you for years and you're not eating? Well, I know that you know that I'm human, right? But they had been trained in leadership not to eat in front of people because other people would perceive them as weak. Don't let them, don't let them see you use the bathroom. Don't let them see you eat because those are the two things that humans do. <laughs> I mean, I'm interpreting. They didn't say that directly. Yeah. But, but, but it's like, those are the two things that humans do. And you've got to posture yourself as God. You know, that's how I interpret that. And it's here's, nuts. here's the thing. That may be an extreme example, but that's a lot. If you read any kind of leadership books, that's a lot of the same in, in, in simpler terms. It's a lot of the same stuff that you have that you have in these books. So with... With a lot of those uh, leadership books, when they posture this, it, it, individualism has so uh, kind of permeated that, that it's caused uh, a whole industry um, of, of arrogant, assertive, uh, even from the time my, my dad could remember times uh, in, in his classes, this talking in the 70s, when they were teaching them how to be CEOs of their church. 
and and that's been taught you know near 20 years and i feel like the tide is starting to turn mm -hmm. in terms of leadership but um the one thing all this material leaves out is a theology of weakness because of what you just said because honestly it's people want to in 20th century america people want to follow something you know how many videos there are on youtube of like how trump shakes hands Mm. Like they're teaching you, like pull the person in, <laughs> put their hand sideways, look at this domineering personality, and they're teaching it as if it's a good Christian ethic. And again, yeah. this isn't to say good Trump, bad Trump, like I'm not I'm not trying to fight this guy or, or the, the political parties that are out there, but that this guy postures himself in a domineering sense of authority, like he's taking that authority, he's taking charge. That is not a Christian position. That is not a Christian thing to do. Our position is one of weakness. We're not trying to lord authority, exercise authority. I know I'm getting ahead of ourselves, but like ours is to be weak and not to posture strength. I've got a, I've got an example of that myself. Um, many years ago, we're talking about 19, oh no, 2002. Okay. Um, I had just graduated college. They had a new campus minister come in and somebody in passing had told me about this Um alpha beta guy thing about ha oh, handshaking yeah, yeah the first this. first per first person to let go of a handshake uh, mm -hmm. is the beta uh and and it's a it's a battle mm -hmm. and this guy had been giving some of my friends some some uh, grief and he was kind of a, a an assertive personality so i went to shake his hand when i first met him and we shook and i thought to myself i'm not gonna let go we shook for over 30 seconds and i finally was like you know what? It's not an issue for me. Yeah. I, you know, I don't need to sword fight. You know, it's, I don't care. But that's the thing, like, like, right? So they'll say, like, if you shake a hand like this, you can shake a hand like that, right? Like, that's your dominating authority. Pull them in. And the pull thing your is, hand over. The thing put is. Put your hand on top of theirs. Hold them in the back of the shoulder. There's so many, like, verbal cues. Don't touch your face. That looks like weakness. Now, here's the thing. All that Bro. stuff, biologically and, and psychologically, is true. It is true. It, it, they work. Yeah. And here's Gordon the Peterson's problem. has got an entire chapter on standing up straight like a lobster. Like <laughs> lobsters fight their battles <laughs> and they have straight postures and our, our serotonin's the same as theirs and all this other stuff. Yeah. And, and it, those things are true and they actually work. Problem is, are they biblical? And more importantly, are these behaviors cultivating the virtues that we want and the virtues God calls us to? And mm. the answer is no. Um, it's nothing more than us debasing ourselves with the practices of the world. So debatably, because of Luther, I mean, this is what Metaxas credits him for really helping modernity, individualism, mm -hmm. striving for that, because Luther is a part of a collective, and he stands out from among the collective and says, this is what the scripture says, mm -hmm. this is what my conscience bears witness with, mm -hmm. um, you know, so before God, I can do no other, right? Like, I can't, I can't recant. I have to do this because of my conscience, and it, and it drives what is individualism. Now, that in one sense is very good because yeah. you are responsible for. Yeah, God there's as an a bit, there's a there's a there's an honest yeah. individual um, individualism in, in the scriptures. You, you're more it's, it's rooted in moral responsibility. Moral responsibility. Yeah. But but the kind of individualism that is dangerous is the kind of that says I am therefore responsible. I am therefore in control. I therefore, uh, and when, when I say control, I'm using mm -hmm. that in a very technical sense of like, hey, um, I I determine where my destiny will go, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in the kind of political discussions that we're having right now, please, guys, don't don't take this out of context. But oftentimes they're saying, if you want to control your destiny, these are the things you have to do. And don't get me wrong, I, I do think that there is wisdom in getting married. I do think there's wisdom in not having kids outside of wed wedlock. I do think there's good uh, wisdom in going to a, a public school, uh, going to, public, going to a, a university, getting a college degree. I think there's real value to those things. But the idea that you control your destiny is not a Christian worldview. Uh, the idea that you're submitted to God and God authors the steps of the righteous. That is the Christian worldview. Yeah. And again, and that's not a Calvinist Arminianist debate. No. That is a biblical debate. As as a person yeah. here, Calvinist, not Calvinist, we say that is a Christian. God is sovereign. We are not, right? Exactly. And and the idea that we put in certain tokens and then out comes this given response means that we're in control, not God. Yes. And what we're saying is there are biblical things that we are commanded to do. 
shocker, like uh, don't have babies outside of wedlock, right? Like shocker, like get married, have a nuclear family. Like those kinds yeah. of things are actually biblical ideas that we want to fight for. But the idea that if we do all the right things, that we're going to get all of the right outcomes, that's not the right biblical idea. I, yeah. I, I am a member of a family who my mom and dad did all of the right things. They intentionally didn't put me in certain schools and took me home to homeschool me because of uh, a learning disability that I had because I was dyslexic. They were like, hey, we're going to pull you in. We're going to care for you. We're afraid on top of the the just the, the, the basic education that I wasn't being allotted in public school because they, you know, you, you, uh, they go as fast as the average. Right. They're not, they're not going to slow down for me. That's just not the way that they crank yeah. out students in public schools, at least when I was a student. Yeah. Um, so so that was that. But then also the ethics, the way that the ethics were going, they brought me home and you'd be like, oh, that's a really great idea for a white middle class family. Right. Well, no, my dad kept getting laid off because he was an airplane mechanic during 9-11. We were broke. We were I mean, it was just it, it was a difficult situation. I got my first job at 14 to like go take care of bills, paid off bills for the family so that we could like survive as a family mm -hmm. unit. Um, the idea that if you do everything right, again, great dad, great mom, great decisions doesn't mean you're going to get great outcomes. Exactly. Right. Um, it, it's a difficult thing. And, and to embrace that, to just go, Oh yeah, I'm gonna do everything right because God commands me to, and I'm gonna be obedient to Him. And then it, when nothing ha when nothing happens right, we end up going, "Why is this happening to me? How dare you, God?" Right. And it what it does is you're exposing who you think really is in charge. That's right. Right. So let's let's talk about that. So we talked about the the why these things happen. Can we talk about what weakness is? What we're talking about? Because I I actually I touched on sin a moment ago, and we don't actually want to conflate that like weakness is sin mm -hmm. um, because that that can, you know, oh, you know, my weakness is I just slept with my girlfriend, right? Like that's not weakness, right? Like that's not the same thing. That's just called uh, sin. Uh, and and that needs to be crucified along with rugged individualism, yeah. right? So please explain to us what is, uh, what is the theology of weakness? How can we understand it? Okay. And now uh, uh, there's an essay by a guy by the name David Black who, uh, who has really... It's a great essay. Uh, um, I'll probably link it somewhere. Um, but he basically lays into what weakness is. And let me give a short definition to begin with. A short definition would be weakness is um, any human limitation or in a natural inability um, or situation that is beyond our control. So that, that's a simple, uh, especially going off of Paul's understanding and Paul's usage of weakness, uh, particularly in 2 Corinthians. Now, uh, David Black lays it out in threefold way. He basically says weakness is used by Paul in three ways. First way is, is human limitation. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, he basically shows how it has some aspects. There are times where Paul kind of implies that there's some sin involved, um, but he's never focusing on that. He, he, Human inability is, for example, like myself, I'm I'm severely dyslexic, and like you said, you you are too, and and that's just not a little thing for me. Um, it changed the course of my life for many years, and uh, God did some really awesome things with that. But but those are those are real human li limitations. Um, but God, I, I had a guy who uh, who I graduated with in seminary who had no arms. Um, he's a, and he, if I'm not mistaken, he's still a preacher. Um, and he literally would turn the page with his feet and he preached. Um, you know, you would say that's kind of strange, but I can tell you right now, just watching someone with the courage to stand up there and preach about, about God's wholeness, how he makes all things whole, um, is powerful. No doubt. And when uh, so that's human limitation. Now, another aspect is is he calls it the Christological aspect of um, of weakness, and what that is is in especially Second Corinthians, those human limitations and those circumstances that are uh, that are beyond our control, maybe because of a lot of times with Paul, it was because of Christ. It was because of the uh, him preaching Christ. Um, other times, it's just situations beyond our control, and there's a lot of them. Um, if you acknowledge that you're not God, you realize how how many things in your life or situations oh, yeah. that are beyond your control. Um, and when uh, when he would say that it's those it's it's understanding those two categories because they build on each other. And in the second category, 
Um, it's being able to take those things and uh, you, and let them be uh, have a cruciform way in you. Um, let them affect you in in a way that you uh, you're willing to be vulnerable and acknowledge your weaknesses. And then you move from acknowledging your weaknesses to having a contentment with them. And then also from there, you, you're able to just um, minister through them. Uh, and easy way of saying that is you're able to be yourself. You can just be you. You don't have to, uh, to be the next T.D. Jakes. You don't have to be the next uh, Chandler. Um, you don't have to be the next, uh, you know, Tim Keller. You don't have to be anybody but you, because guess what? God made you as you are. And for all the hiccups and for all the things, like anytime I've pastored, I'm terrible at uh, announcements. Mm -hmm. I do announcements awful. Um, but every church I've ever pastored in, they came to love me for it because I'm not going to be anything that I'm not. I am me. Yeah. And for me to do that is for me to dishonor God himself. And we have an entire culture right now where it's like, hey, actually, I'm going to pay a third party organization to write my sermons for me. Right. And I'm going to get up there and I'm going to posture and pretend like it's mine because I want a bunch of academic people or, you know, clever people who write well to make me look really good in front of my audience. And that doesn't feed into a posture of weakness. How do I pull from my own experience? How do I pull from my own pain, from my own weakness? That requires a level of transparency that we don't see in pulpits. Often, not always, I don't want to paint with a broad brush here, but here's a, here's a phrase that just comes in contrast to what you're talking about. Uh, it's a, it's a, I think it's a marine phrase, but pain is weakness leaving the body right? That is a triumphalistic view yes. of weakness, Yes. right? That I'm having pain. Why am I having pain? Because well, I'm getting stronger because, than my weakness. Because I'm getting stronger than my weakness. I am destroying my weakness through suffering. And there's a Christian view, Christian view, there's a Christian packaged view of weakness yes. that says you're going to go through suffering because there's this part of you that's weak. God's going to make it strong. Yes. And it's like, or... <laughs> Maybe it just stays weak forever. Like, I mean, here's a crazy thought. Like, um, we're, there was a specific situation in, in my life that I couldn't get around. It caused me to feel immensely rejected from the church. And I come home one day after just bawling my eyes out. And my son looks at me and is like, Dad, why are you crying? And I go, oh, your dad wants to be God. He wants to be sovereign in control of the rest yeah. of his life. And there are things that I want to do that I can't do. And there are things that, that I want to go a certain way that I just can't make happen. And he looked at me and like, he's like seven now, but he was six at the time. He was just like, yeah, I get that. I like basically in control of nothing, you know, like he just like, yeah, that's been my life. Like, welcome to the real world, dad, yeah. you know, like one of those wake up moments. And, uh, uh, that, that's what it is. We think, we think pain is like, well, one day I won't be like this. I won't have this need for validation or I won't have this, this, this need for, uh, uh, intimacy, or I won't have this this pain in me. But it's like, no, you're actually supposed to minister through that. And there is something to be said about wholeness. And there's something to be said about healing and those kinds oh, of yeah, things there, that we don't want to we don't want to brush over. Yeah, and there's time for counseling. There's, there's time. Absolutely. There's time for such things. Yeah, but we don't want to, at the same token, um, minimize weakness as if it's something to be conquered, but as something to be embraced as a Christian thing. So, um, and I, I kind of gave a story back into that. You talked about your dyslexia. I mean, you, you want to unpack for us a little bit how this has affected you and how a theology of weakness is something that, that you've been embracing, you've been walking through. Okay. Um, yeah, a good unless way to, I, unless we touched on something too briefly that you want to. No, 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 no. Out. Um, probably to give you a little bit of that story, I, I've written, I've written about it. That's right. In a blog. Very good. Um, link here. Yeah. <laughs> well, with me, I was diagnosed, uh, when I was in the second grade and that diagnosis ended up, uh, put me on a path where I was kind of the, the, I was, I wasn't, I was kind of an athlete, but I was just enough of an athlete, uh, for people to take notice and, uh, to turn a blind eye to my inability to read. Uh, but luckily, through Providence, I was in a place where they could help me. And up until the eighth grade, I was getting I didn't I didn't have a free summer. I was going to, to reading camps and all, all through middle school up into the eighth grade. 
And even then, I only got to where I was reading on eighth grade level. Um, and all through high school, I got socially promoted because, well, that's what you do when you want to make sure, you know, the guys are playing football. So at the end of the day, and, and I'm shorthanding it. I mean, there's some people who, who really helped, just to be clear. Uh, but when I got into college, they did a test on me and they found out I was only reading it on an eighth grade level. Um, but I wasn't a Christian, came Christian and fell in love with the Bible, uh, read it phrase by phrase, devoured it, loved it. Um, and God met me in my weakness. Um, and I still, uh, to this day, uh, there's no way I can, to talk about it, it just, it feels humbling. It's to, to know that after a year of just reading the Bible during that time, after I was tested, I had to be tested again. And when they tested me again, I was reading uh, on a college freshman level. Um, and that was the power of God working. Because I can tell you right now, I still read the same. Yeah, It still is hard, but for some reason, um, God has helped me. Yeah, uh, And there's days where my wife always tells me that when, I, when, I, when I'm preaching, she can tell the, her, her little cue for when God shows up is the way I read the text changes. Um, and I, I mean, it's really true. Yeah. I've heard it on the t on tapes and it's just, it makes me giggle because for me to know that God is with me is the greatest joy in the in my life. Sure. Because that's the only thing I, I desire. I, I, I would rather be myself and have him with me than fake being something I'm not and in my own strength, try to hold a ministry together. And this is why God uses like the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Right? And it's his, it's his method throughout the Bible. For David, sure. uh, Moses. Moses Gideon. had a study, stuttering potty problem. Gideon. Was a chicken. Yeah, he was a chicken. And <laughs> love that. Because what does the angel do? The angel says, angel says oh, man, mighty man of God speaks, speaks who, he, who he will be, not who he is. Yeah. And, then, and then takes him through a process that doesn't make him great but makes him weaker and weaker and weaker at the end of a, of that, of that, that essay by uh, David Black. And it is a, just a, a deeply biblical essay. It's, it's a high end scholarship. He ends it with saying, you can clearly see God's pattern is he makes men weaker and weaker and weaker until we can do nothing but trust in God's strength. Come on. And, and okay. So, but, so, but we want to, I'll tell you of that. There are, there's an entire culture of Christianity that says, Hey, we're not going to call things that they are, right? There are things that we perceive that we perceive they struggle with this, but we're not going to talk about that. We're mm -hmm. not going to address that issue. We're just going to keep talking. Oh, I just, you're just so righteous. You're just so holy. They cheated on their wife three times, right? Like mm -hmm. we don't want to pretend with that token, there is a sovereign God who's outside of the universe who can see a situation and what it's going to be and then call the thing that's not, right? Yes. Yeah. We don't get to go, oh, you're an adulterer? Well, I see that God just says that you're righteous and holy. It's like, yeah, you yes. still you still got to get you still got to deal with your you ability gotta, to you still got to clean it up. Keep your pants. And part up. of part of counseling is is really seeing things as they yes. are, so that you can hit, you can hit the face on. Yes. Part of the theology of your weakness is having an honest assessment of where Who we're at are. right now. Um, you know, really, what this again. This posturing is, is to look at who we are and pretend like we're not. Mm -hmm. And we can't, under the guise of faith, say, oh, I'm not, I'm not dyslexic or I'm not weak in this area. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm actually much stronger See, than I used to do that. Those things. I used yeah. to do that for years. What I would do is I would, I would say, oh gosh, hey, um, as I was talking to people, I'd put on a big personality and anybody who's known me for years, like years ago, they, they'll tell you. I used to be the biggest personality, just, oh, just I'm out there. But when I'm, when I was like that, I would also never talk about myself. And I would always ask questions about the other guy and I always avoided the conversations. And one day a really good friend, we're talking about someone who was just, a, just tight as can be, literally said to me, I don't even know if you have sisters or brothers. And that was when I literally realized that day, I was like, I don't, tell anybody. And I, was, and I thought it was good. Oh, I'm not talking about myself. No, there's a way to, to gain self-adulation without talking about yourself. If you're a skilled communicator, you can make people love you mm -hmm. by talking about other people. And they have a phrase in leadership called it's lonely at the top. 
right? And this idea is the farther up in leadership you go, the less people you can trust, the less people that you can let close to you because you'll get Judas, you'll get, you'll get, you know, Aiken, you'll get someone to stab you in the back, right? Like literally had a, a leader in my life and they would, they they'd preach these sermons on like, hey, be careful. Like when you start getting the leadership, you're going to start getting these people and those people in your life. Keep your circle small. And like the idea is don't let them see you bleed because if they see you bleed, they're going to have a dagger. They're trying to finish the job. And, and there's some truth. There's some truth to that. Uh, but, and it takes discernment, uh, but at the same time, uh, it does not, it should not push us away from the call to being, uh, vulnerable and transparent. So um, when you say there's some truth to that, like there's truth to, that to people, being lonely at the top? That people will try to, that there will, oh, people will, will try, try to stab, to stab you. you in the back. Sure, but like you don't have to be at the top to be stabbed uh, in the back. Yeah. <laughs> like let's just be honest, like you just have to be a person around other people to be stabbed in the back. This is like, true. That's it. Yeah. And. Yeah, and I think what happens is people take that to, to to such a degree is they they close themselves off from everybody. Yeah. Um. And again, when you mix, you start mixing these things together, and you start seeing a picture of the modern, uh, the modern big big time pastor. Um, not to say that a person can't have a big ministry, because I can tell you right now, uh, there's ministers I know that are really, would say top top notch, big, you know, have have a have a big platform that God gave them. Um, that are handling it well. Sure. Um, but a lot of times what happens is that guy, he hears things like, oh, he gets lonely at the top of you. You can't, you got to keep those away. Okay, you got to look like you're perfect. Okay, I've, I've got to make sure I don't say this around these people. And what really happens is I call it the whittling of the emails. There's this, just this whittling away of people in emails who say, hey, you need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do this. Mm-hmm. And it, pecks away at you to where you begin to go, okay, okay, I'll just kind of put up a front of who I am so that these people will just be pacified. These emails will be pacified. And it's an email filter. Yeah, literally. I mean, people were controlled by their emails today. The ministry, I believe ministry is in a lot of ways, um, the habituation of, of ministry by emails by the process of emails is is another sub- subject altogether, but a dangerous one. Character forming. It, it is deeply character forming and deeply character flawing. Hmm. It flaws us more than anything else because uh, we pick and choose who we see and who we talk to, uh, and we begin to do that based on self. Uh, what, what 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 works best for us? So, Not who needs the most. Who needs the most a care? So we've talked about. Okay, we said why is this important. What is a theology of weakness? How does it affect us? But now that we've gotten through all the subjective stuff that I think is helpful. Yeah. Let's somewhat, get to the yeah. text. Let's get to, let's get to what are our core texts that illustrate a theology of weakness, embracing weakness. What does that look like for the Christian? Well, let's set it up first. As uh, I say what instead of what? Yeah. Uh, as I stumble across my words weekly, let's get into it. That sounds good. But to begin just the context of Second Corinthians is uh, a letter that Paul wrote to to really push back against what the super apostles is his term, his derogatory term for them. Uh, more than likely, these guys were people who who act like they had it all together. They had great rhetorical skills. They were they were definitely in the pocket of their culture. In other words, they knew how to use their culture and the values that the culture held were the values that they were espousing to show strength, to, um, to always talk about, uh, the, the good things that happen, to always talk about the good stories, to never give a story, uh, that describes them in a negative Mm -hmm. light, to always make them the hero of, of everything they talk about. Um, and this is true of Corinth, like Corinth, was a place that economically, it was one of the few places that you had true freedom. Now, when you read First and Second Corinthians, it's so important. Um, Corinthians was the only city that because there were so many free men in that city, and because of the way the city was structured, that it was economically viable for in the first century, you to move up the caste system. Now, this is extremely forming for a, for a society, because if you can You move, could literally pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Bingo. And what does that produce? It produces a deep seated uh, individualism that is rooted in um, competition Yep, and produces self-sufficiency. It promotes self-sufficiency, promotes uh, self-aggrandizing, promotes all... I can control my destiny. As long as I put the hard work in, I can get on top. I can control my future, my destiny, 
the things that have that have been put in front of me, I can use these tools because of the society that I have. Yeah, exactly. So when you do that, what happens is uh, you create a culture. You add you add the gospel to it, um, and you know he had some. Uh, Paul says I had some I had some good inroads to begin with. The Paul took root, but then, like any kind of culture, if you understand missionary stuff, any kind of cultural. Uh, shifts don't happen after the immediate reception. The immediate reception of the gospel is often pretty quick, and you can you can build a small church. But it's from that point that you then got to fight against the culture, mm-hmm. um, and that's what we have at this point. These people have come in, and they've said Paul's nothing. I mean, and Paul even here's the thing: Paul does not say no, uh, no. I have raised guys from the dead. He doesn't say I, which have, is what they were looking for. Yes. Right? Because in 1 Corinthians, we see that there's dissensions, there's divisions amongst people because of the gift sets that they have. They're yes. like, we have these gifts, we're better than them, right? So for Paul to win in that church, one of the easiest things for him to be was like, dude, I, you, dude, I sneeze and see miracles, right? Yes. Like, like Hankies I, I, I got, give to people. Literally, like I, yeah, yeah I'm, I am, I am a chewing people freedom and deliverance. Exactly. Like, he, he could just be like, hey. Uh, I am one of the apostles ordained by Jesus, which which he does. But but you, you're just saying, but like, but he could he could he could flex on these broke boys real easy, yeah. real easy. But instead, chooses a different path. He chooses to agree with them. Like they give about five, I think it's four or five arguments uh, that he that he that you can read in the text uh, are very clearly of why he's weak of why he's weak, and he basically says for uh, for one. Uh, they basically say that he, he's a poor he's he's a poor leader uh, because he can't speak because. He, where do they say that? Okay, because because again, like if we if we say, hey, they're saying this, this is about great. Paul. This is how great. is he addressing it? This is great. Uh, it's in Second uh, Corinthians ten, yeah, ten ten. It says, "For they say his letters are weighty and strong." Now they're saying this about Paul. They're saying, yeah, he he brings it in his letters. But his bodily presence is weak. In other words, that now when you, you know, he ain't got no stage presence, he ain't got no. It's exactly, exactly. It's not. It's not. Oh, he's he's frail. It's literally he's got. Yo, no he writes a mean blog, but homie, homie is, can't, is homie stumbling can't over his words. Yeah. And, and his speech is of no account. And you go to verse six. Uh, here's Paul's response. Even if I am unskilled in speaking. Verse six of uh, 11, 11. 11. Yeah, 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 yeah. he says in the first part, even if I am unskilled in speaking, he literally says, even if I am unskilled, he so says he owns it. He owns it. He says so uh, because he can say that can because in in weakness, because he knew the secret to all this, yeah. that in his weakness, if he admitted it, acknowledged it, owned it, he was himself. He then could have the power of God. He's. We'll have a story in Acts yep. of him literally preaching so poorly. A guy falls asleep, falls out of the window, and dies. He killed a guy preaching. It, br- it brings an entire different meaning to he was slaying it in that sermon. Oh, I mean, it's just he just word. he he murdered it. Man. Yeah, he, he murdered it. Crazy sermon. You know, but what was he able to do? Not he himself by any right. means. He didn't do it. He didn't do a thing. But ask God. He went down, laid hands on the guy, rose the guy from the dead. And then I love that. This is my favorite part about that passage. And then it says, and then he went back to preaching until dawn. Like that happened at midnight. And he preached until dawn for like the next seven hours. He preached. And you get to do that. Downstairs, obviously. Uh, Yeah, obviously, (laughs) obviously. Nobody could sit in the window, you know. Yeah. But but you have people's attention at that point. Yeah. Um, And they wanted him to tell stories. Honestly, here's the thing. They wanted him to tell stories like that. Because it those would have are, stimulated Corinth. That, that would have stimulated Corinth. That's why he, that's why he avoids it. Mm-hmm. It's why what we'll see later why he why he talks the way he does about some of his experiences, because he wants in the in he understands the culture, and he postures himself because he throughout the first and second uh, books of Corinth, both books, he postures himself through a theology of the cross. It is central to the understanding of both books. So in, in this passage, they're like, hey, he doesn't speak super well. And even in First Corinth, he says, hey, I didn't come to you with persuasive words of wisdom. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But but then it's... And that and that actually means... Okay. And this is a, a keener. Come on. I, I'm reading uh, keener on this. This is, a, this is a keen thought is what you're saying. Yeah, it's a very keen thought. Is that that actually means rhetorical flair. 
and rhetorical manipulation. So double alliteration. Yeah. His sermon points rhymed. I'm just kidding. And, I'm and just he kidding. had the, I'm he just had, kidding, guys. He, Sorry. He had the ability to to use his words in such a way to say things that weren't true that made people believe they were. Um, so persuasive words. It's not just you can have. I believe in persuasive arguments. I believe Mars in Hill. using what Mars Hill. Mars Hill. Oh. When Paul did a persuasive I was argument. Thinking, I was thinking of the church. I was like, oh, oh we're going there, right? <laughs> it's, like, it's like, wow. Uh, wow we are going there. there. This is a quick, I mean, whiplash. That was so quick. No, I mean, I mean in the Bible, the okay, Bible good. version. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like he believes in persuasive arguments. Um, and I don't believe that the reason the reason he he focused on, he said, I preached Christ crucified in First Corinthians is because is because he he failed at Athens. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, no, no. I don't I don't hold to that. But what I do believe is that that he he learned that in the culture of Corinth, for him to to preach um, like he did in Athens, would have not been good. Right. Um, because there are times you can appeal to the cultural motif without without so, offending the gospel, and then it, but in places like Corinth, if he had done that, like the super apostles did, he would have he would have produced um, a people that would have not been able to grow in the gospel. So you made a statement that, that he didn't go on telling these stories where it was like, hey, uh, I'm going to double down. I'm going to really aggressively tell the story about where I raised this dude from the dead or where I'm passing out hankies everywhere and everyone's getting healed. You yeah. Know, Get you hanky. You know, but in this passage, it says he did come with a demonstration of power. Explain to me what demonstration of power is, because, again, my context, my background, right, the Pentecostals that I that I came from, the, the, the way we posture is like he went to Athens and he preached at Hadi intellectually theologically correct sermon with all of his apologetics and few were saved there but then he came with the power right like this literally uh-huh. like charismania like when when he came with that uh-huh. then many were saved right uh, so that kind of seems to fly in the face against what you just told me that he wasn't posturing that he was spiritually what's the word spiritually uh i don't know affluent manifestations took place all the way all everywhere around him so what was the demonstration of power in first corinthians well i mean you can have a demonstration of power i mean that that that's a god thing that's not something you uh, produce so he, wasn't, he wasn't he wasn't posturing telling the stories he was just displaying it he was just displaying it he, yeah. and he literally said uh, well, i'm this is what what does he say the one of his arguments against the super apostles is what is the marks of an apostle mm-hmm. signs wonders and miracles Mm-hmm. literally uh in ch- in the chapter of 13 that uh, in chapter 13 that's what he basically lays out as one of the signs so so that's mm-hmm. that's not, and what he's doing there is he's referring back to to those moments more than likely in Corinth when he was either preaching and uh but that term for power to get back to that actual question mm-hmm. that term for power uh it has a broad meaning can mean because what is the most powerful thing that can ever happen is the conversion of the soul sure so so and, and everybody goes groans at that point because no one wants to really believe that, but it's true. Right. So at the end of the day, that's... you need to hang out with a Calvinist. You'll figure it out. <laughs> no, well, I mean, seriously though, I mean, there's to there... bring a dead man to life, to bring the soul from from life to death, to to regenerate the inner man, 100%. so that there, there's no doubt. Yeah, if someone is raised from the dead, they're going to die again. Yeah, exactly. No big, exactly. Right? But if 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 they if they have eternal life. Yeah, and and it's a big deal. And it's nothing more. And what we're talking about is nothing more. Just refocusing the lens. This is just one click of the lens. This doesn't mean you give up those things. I'm I, like, I want to. I pray for those. I, I sure, sure, sure. run yeah. for those things as hard as possible. But you never leave focus uh, of what Paul says is central. And that's and when when he talks about the cross, you know, he preached the uh, Christ crucified. It doesn't mean he just said Christ was crucified because guess what? In the story in Athens, he preached Christ crucified. If I recall correctly, the very next chapter after he said, I didn't come to you the persuasive words of wisdom, uh-huh. right? I think the persuasive words is the one that you say, like, lofty or whatever. Later on in chapter two, I believe, if I'm, maybe it's chapter three, I forget. The, the and it's also chapter, style. Like, what he's getting at is their style. Right. He, he then says, I wanted to come with you to you with wisdom, but you couldn't handle it. Right. So there's so also like a spiritual you... ma- maturity of like, hey, there was a demonstration of power. Absolutely. Uh-huh. But because you couldn't handle the theological acronym that I wanted to give you. Right. So it does seem like there was like knowledge. And again, you, 
feel free to correct me, and then the way that that knowledge was communicated. But then he's saying, but I couldn't give you just the knowledge because you weren't old enough, you weren't mature enough, you weren't spiritually aware enough to handle what I meant to give to you. Yeah, he had to, to meet to them because like anytime you're evangelizing, you meet somebody where they are. That's right. Um, and you have to kind of see where their terms are. And then yeah, here, here's the biblical term of that. Now let me move you to here. Um, okay, so I've gotten you way off track, Dawson. Yeah, totally. we, we were we were talking totally. about okay, the super apostles were like, yeah. "Hey, I was just setting the context." This then. is this is this is the first the first stance was, "Dude's not a good preacher." Yeah, and right? he, they have he's, four though. Yeah, and the basic he does he's not good with his time. He's not good with uh, time management. He can't be trusted. He because basically he said at one point, "Hey, I'm going to be there." at this time and he, he and he couldn't be there. Um, the sec, next one, was, he's not good with Every money. Every pastor said amen. Right? Yeah, I know. Right, right. <laughs> you do not know how hard it is sometimes. But then the other one is like, um, I, I think off the top of my head, it's, it has to do with, mo- it has to do with money uh, that, that he's, he never took, okay. There's a thing called the Patre- uh, Patreon mm-hmm. is, is a, Hey, 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 hey. be careful. <laughs> just, it's so room. ironic that they named it Patreon. I'm just kidding. Because what patrons what, in 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 the time of uh, of the cor- or the Corinthian letters, a patron was someone who gave you money uh, because they liked your speaking and they let you speak or your art or your art or yeah. anything um, it, for the philosophers and the and the sophists is what it, what it basically because that don't pay good. Like you don't just get to walk around and be like, hey, I've been philosophizing about. The way the but they didn't. Works. They, but they didn't expect you to. They didn't. It was not. A, if you were that kind of guy, mm-hmm. well, you were. What was your job? My job is to speak. That's right. So what do you do? Well, I speak. Mm-hmm. Okay, I will fund you to do that if you'll come over to my house on Tuesday and 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 you know, entertain us with a good speech. Um, and they had people who would do that. And now it was for those for that for that group for the sophists for for that group of people, especially in Corinth. It was both an entertainment for the rich. And more importantly, uh, those people did not work for their own money. That was how they earned their living. So for someone to say, nah, I'm not going to take any money from you. Mm-hmm. I'm actually going to work as a tent maker in the market was, A, you don't love us. Because if, if you loved us, you would take our money. And the second thing is he saying, I'm going to go be an auto mechanic is the basic thing. He's, he's saying, I'm going to go do something, some menial labor that's not going to get me nearly as much money, mm-hmm. but I'm going to go do that on the side while I, I, I will, we'll, we'll, on Sunday, we'll talk about Christ. So he's doing everything he can to posture himself against this culture that is very toxic. Mm. Um, and then by the time we get to, you know, get to, the, to, to chapter uh, uh, 13, chapter 12, um, he's run through those arguments. I like to call Second Corinthians uh, Jesus' one two. Um, Jesus's uh, Paul's one two punch. So it, he he gives a jab at the beginning. He talks about ministry and the kingdom, and then the from ten to thirteen is like this uppercut where he just he lays into the sarcasm. He lays heavy into his argument. Uh, uh, I mean, it's it's like oh, this man's speaking my love language, and it's it's glorious because he's like they like they're like. You're you're slow. You you're even not. You don't even look right. I mean, they actually literally say he. You know that he's. That you don't. He's, you don't wear the skinny jeans. You don't have the smoke machine. Yeah. You're not clever with your illustrations, your and, applications. And of course, your, there's a fine line there because there's times where we need. Where Paul's also like, hey, there's times you need to be. Sure, sure, sure. You need to. Um. You need to be. You need to wear skinny jeans. Need to sometimes. be all things to all men. There are times that you need to be all things to all men. Look, skinny mm-hmm. jeans are never. Part of that situation. Yeah, skinny. I gotta get out the skinny jean thing. Skin, let's just go ahead and say it. Skinny jeans are not biblical. Moving on. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Done said. <laughs> so at the end, okay. At the end, when we get in, when we get into this understanding of weakness, we want to uh, we want to hit the the root of it. Is Paul's point is that all Christians ministry or not in ministry, but we're going to focus in on on ministry aspects for yeah. just a second. Um, in chapter thirteen. He begins to uh, he begins to basically say that the paradigm he, he shows at that point the paradigm for ministry and the paradigm for ministry for Paul um, is very because of his structure because he, he's coming from a theology of the cross he's bringing that in 
And he then sits it, he, he sits it down and, and uh, to understand theology of the cross, Luther really articulated Paul's theology of the cross really well. And it's, it, it, there'll be a study guide for this. Uh, so we'll, we'll shortchange it. But the basic gist is that in the cross, you see, you, you see the truest picture of God. Mm-hmm. That's one aspect. And also, Paul, especially in the Corinthian letters, goes on to show that in the cross, you see the pattern for the Christian life. This is also in Mark. Mark is another place you see it. Uh, Mark is a great example of, of how um, you see a picture of Jesus that also implies uh, we need to be as, as self-sacrificial and as self-serving as he is. In, in this picture in Paul, we see as verse uh, four, 13, 4, For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. Have you ever thought Jesus is Jesus is a weak God? Talk about a statement that doesn't run run right, but it's a true statement of Him on the cross. Mm-hmm. And is that the truest picture of God? Mm. It is for a desperate humanity that knows their own failings and fa- failures. Um, it is an what does it say to the to the Hebrew for the Greeks? It was offensive. Why was it offensive for the Greeks? Because they would see, wait a minute, you're telling me this person who died on a cross, weakness and suffering and shame of a cross, I'm supposed to worship? I worship might, power, glory, mm-hmm. pulling myself up by my bootstraps. I, I worship I worship winning in the end. Mm-hmm. Every one of my movies better end well. Started at the bottom now I'm here. Yeah. And and there's nothing wrong with with a good. Uh, I love them just as much as the yeah. next day. Everyone wants to remember the Titans. It's yeah, great. exactly. Classic. It, there's always times to be inspired that way. But what are we getting at here? Is this is the paradigm for how we live our life as well as ministry? Is that you're someone who like God Himself, Deity, Jesus, not just in His humanity, but He was crucified because He's a whole being. You know. Yeah. You, I'll let you. I'll let you parse that. Well, there's so many things again that that, that fights that fights out with our worldview with yeah. that with that concept is that Jesus did all the right things. We talked about this at the top. You do all the right things, you get the right outcome. Not all. He did the right thing. Yes. And he was crucified. Yes. Okay. And the Bible says they're going to hate us. Yes. Because we did the right things. Yes. Like like destruction. Right. Mm-hmm. So again, this. This idea that we are the arbiters of our destiny, we are the captain of our soul, uh, we are, the, as Imagine Dragons would say, the lightning before the thunder, right? Like we, we, we are, we, we are the, like, that's just the afterglow, right? Like I'm, I am blazing the trail. I'm, I am, I am the captain of my, of my destiny. This idea is so Western, yes, right? And don't get me wrong. There is personal responsibility that I love, that we need to back, that we need to be, we need to say, hey, that's a biblical, that's a biblical thing. But the idea that we can control our destiny through personal responsibility is a lie. It's a facade. It's the Western facade. And I want to push, I'm going to push most pastors, most Christians are going to say they agree with you on that. Mm -hmm. And if I can just say this to you, that's not what you really believe if you just look at your behavior. Because at times, we will live from a center where, like I said earlier, you know, Jesus, uh, A.W. Tozer quote, there's, there's a cross and a um, throne in every man's heart. And Jesus is either on the cross and we're on the throne or we're on the cross and Jesus is on the throne. And only mm-hmm. the second is true. And there's a place where we have to recognize that we may not agree with that intellectually, but how are we, how are we living our life? How, what, what does our life image on a day-to-day basis? So he's crucified in weakness, but he lives by the power of God. Now this is the paradigm for ministry, crucifixion and resurrection. It's this, you see it in, in first Peter as well, that, that the paradigm for ministry is a ministry that walks in the crucifixion of Christ to experience the the resurrection power of God. Now, when I say resurrection power of God, I mean that in the broadest terms possible. Hmm. Uh, guess what? 
our cessationist brothers can walk in that same resurrection right. power. 100%. They can walk in that same resurrection power because God is converting souls left and right. You know, you're talking to an ex-missionary here. So I'm going to talk about people, people coming to know Christ because I got my categories blown when I was just hanging out with Muslims and they're coming to you because they're, they're seeing visions of Jesus and, and you know, that changed, changed me big time. Cause you know, it, it honestly, it makes, it makes ministry a little bit easier, but also a little harder cause you got to really impact the deity of Christ. It's funny. We were at, we were at, uh, had uh, lunch having this conversation with this one. I, I said, first time I met your kid, um, we were at lunch having this conversation about you're at church telling your testimony, how you had a vision of God. And in your vision of God, your Christian friends didn't believe you. And then you had to go to the Middle East to find a bunch of Muslims yeah. to tell them your story. And the Muslims believe you had a vision of God. You yeah. had to find a Muslim to believe that God revealed himself to you. Yeah, and that's, Christians how, wouldn't believe that's how I came to know Christ. That's just pretty funny. The, the short of it. That's yeah. classic. Um, uh, but just, to, okay, so in four, and we, what we have here is we have basically, so he says, but in dealings with you, we, we as Paul's referring to ministers, but you can refer to the whole church, uh, will live with him by the power of Christ. In other words, we are in union with Jesus. In that union, we place ourselves in a cruciform pattern of life. Mm -hmm. um, great book on this, guys. D.A. Carson's The Cross um, uh, and The Christian Ministry. A Christian minister. I can't remember if it's one or the other. But <sighs> give yourself time read that book. It is amazing yeah. because he outlines what it means to walk that form, not just for a Christian, not just for a leader, but also for, you can easily translate it to all people. Um, and what we see in our lives is the power of God begin to flow out because we're accepting our weaknesses. That's because we got to get back here real quick before we finish in verse 12, uh, chapter 12, verse, what was it? Verse nine. nine? nine yeah, it was nine, 10. Um, I'm just going to read it. So this is Jesus. This is one of the few times we have in the New Testament where Jesus actually, where we have uh, outside of the Gospels, we have we have a statement of Christ. Uh, this is actually one of the few times. Uh, Post-resurrection statements. Uh, the, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will not boast all the more gladly. I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So this story, a very popular passage, everyone knows it, hotly contested. Yep. There's something in his flesh, mm -hmm. a thorn in his flesh is what Who he cares? says. Right? Yeah. Who cares? Right. Not important to, this, to, the, to, the, to the application we're talking about. Not thorn important in his to flesh. his point. Uh, to, uh, uh, he said a messenger from Satan sent to buffet him that God had sent this thing. It, but, but the thing is, is here, to his point, the point, the point is not the thorn. It wasn't like, how did the thorn happen? What's, what's God's sovereignty? What's our personal responsibility? That's what we want to run to. Yeah. But the point of this passage is I was proud. I was weak. He was made strong. Exactly. Right. I was strong before and I actually needed a thorn so that his power could be displayed. Well, it's not even, even kind of broader in the full context of what he's arguing in the letter is he actually argues one of like we said about one of those power stories. Mm -hmm. He actually kind of plays into that a little bit and says, even though I'm here's my idea. And this is just me. He probably has told this story to the Corinthians before. Mm -hmm. uh, so they kind of know it. And it, that's why he goes, I know a man. I know a man. And uh, uh, yes, 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 yes. I know a Checks man. Out. And this is that kind of sarcasm that is pushing back against the, the it, literally it's using their tools against them. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it is a baller move is what it is. And he basically goes, uh, he goes, I know a man who, who went to the third heaven. So he's describing this great experience that is not lawful for him to tell. Yeah. And then he says, hey. It's got the hyper charismatics watering at the mouth. Yeah. Oh, what a great story. It, but, but what does he say? He says, you know, first of all, I'm not, I'm not, I was not allowed to tell, any, uh, to tell anything that happened. Uh, that was just for me. So I got to keep quiet about it. But on top of that, um, the Lord wanted to humble me because in my heart, the Lord knows best for us because he can see our hearts. Mm -hmm. He, he brought it, he brought me low and he gave me a thorn because I needed to be humbled. So we we can assume that, that this, this experience put some pride in Paul's heart. Mm -hmm. And 
it humbled him so that so that's the context now what was the bigger context is that is that he's telling that story and he told it that way he basically took a power story and then Flipped it on its head. Flipped it on its head. Had them, had them walk into that right hook, right? Oh, yeah. They're like, oh, yeah. So there's this power story. And then like, oh, yeah, he, he did have this story. And it's like, oh, but by the way, that was just an opportunity to humble me, not an opportunity to puff me up. Yeah, so it's he was not. Saying, pride. Yes, I had pride. It was exactly. Sinful. So it's not. So it's not a story um, that we are to exegete and try to figure out if healing's involved in this, et cetera. Yeah, so yeah. it's not about that. It's about he was using the story. For a bigger purpose, which was which the purpose was, hey, uh, there are times that 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 weakness is good. Yeah, and and, and what does that describe? Now the dynamics are clear in, in the passage. The passage uh, in verse nine is very clear. It says, "Power, my power, is made perfect in weakness." Mm-hmm. So the, the the traditional interpretation of that is that the power uh, that Christ's power is perfected, is most glorified in our weakness. That he gets the most glory in you when he uses us if we'll depend on him, lean into him, and be honest with our weaknesses. Phenomenal. Uh, there's a story I remember when we were in public high school. There's this guy named Fable. His name is Mr. Fable, and he was a legend, so then he was perfect. Anyway, um, he was one of the school teachers who allowed us to have access to his, his room so we could do our like Bible studies and like home groups and stuff like that in public high school. And uh, anyway, he told me the story of his kid and his kid came out to the car and was like, dad, 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 help me. Let me help you take your books inside. And his books were in a crate. And he said his, his kid was like, I want to say he's like five or four or something. Like the books would have crushed him. It was so heavy. So his dad contorts his body into a, Mr. Fable contorts his body into a certain way to kind of carry the books, like the brunt of the weight and give him the appearance that he's like cooperating and holding the books. Right. Uh-huh. And he's walking in and he's like, look, it was actually way easier for me to just carry them in by myself. But the joy of partnership with my son in his weakness, right. Yeah. Gave me a sense of, he enjoyed it. He had, of enjoyment. Where like it's actually my strength, and, and in Ephesians when it talks about the armor of God, mm-hmm. right? Like, oh, armor, valiant warrior, fight! And it's like, yeah, not yours, God's armor, the armor of God. And yes. then it says, be strong in the power of His, his might. might, not ours, not our righteousness, not Come our on faith, now. not Come our on well. Now. You know, it's it's like it's it's His. It's yes. they, they they belong to Him. They're not from us. It's externos. It's outside of ourselves, and to look beyond ourselves to. God. And this is, again, this is one of the things Westerners, we, we will, we will fall short of. It's like, okay, God's so great. Now these are the things you do. We run straight to application constantly because these are the things that we want. We want control. We want like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And it's like, no, rest in the power of his strength, of his might stand in his power. And, and when we're talking about a theology of weakness, um, I'm reminded of, uh, an interview we had with Dr. Elizabeth Lewis Hall, to have people check that out. You told me, mm-hmm. hey, you're going to bring this up in this interview. I know it. But that passage in Philippians 2, right, where it talks about yes. God humbling himself in the form of a servant. Jesus humbles himself in the form of a servant. He said, let that heart be in you that was in Christ, right? And then later on, he goes, that I may know him. I want to know Christ in the, 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 what was it, the, 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 the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, right? That resurrection life that you talked about, mm-hmm. but the fellowship of his sufferings, that it's not, um, again, I, I always viewed weakness. I always used suffering because I think these two terms can really be interchangeable in many ways. I always viewed those as a kind of vain triumphalistic, eventually I'll be well, eventually I'll be whole, eventually God will work this out of me. But this idea that I actually get to know him, that weakness isn't just like, hey, be weak so that God can be displayed, that God can be glorified. There's a bit of Christian hedonism here, right? I actually get to know God mm-hmm. in that weakness. And God actually resists the proud. And if we're truly Christians and we want to know God, this is part of our invitation in knowing him, is embracing that weakness. Yeah, There is there is a, a promised presence, if you will, that accompanies embracing of trial, embracing of weakness, embracing of suffering as I know he's in control. And I'm not. And relinquishing that driver's seat, if you will, mm-hmm. as an opportunity and invitation into knowing God better. And I think that for me is always the greatest motivation to to 
any kind of action of like, hey, you need to you need to embrace weakness. Well, why? Well, this glorifies God. And ultimately, I want to glorify God, but I want to glorify God in an intimate way where I know him. Yes. Right. Like I don't want to have I don't want to glorify this theistic God who spun the world into existence. Would that be enough? It would be, but like there's something better. It's like the knowledge of him that I get to be with him. He is with me, that we know each other in this unique way. And to give you support for that, for that. That application is looking at first Corinthians, second Corinthians 13, same verse, verse four, the end of it, it says, we will live with him. That's right. So that there, there's that. That's with the him. payoff. That's the payoff. That's the with God life. Yeah. That's the life that, that we know intimate friendship with God and that intimate friendship with God. I, I can tell you right now, if you've ever been through anything in your life, you know, the only thing that'll get you through is friendship with Jesus. Yeah. Um, that at the end of the day, when everyone seems to have turned turned away from you, when all is lost, you can sit there in the silence of your heart, and he says, "I'm here. Yeah, I'm with you." You know, and there's a beauty in that 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 we we have lost. Yeah. Uh, that 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 kind of friendship is what God calls us to, and that's what makes life sweet. Well, we're, we're already quite a bit over. What I'll do is I'm going to give a closing thought and then I have you do the same thing. That one little nugget you want people walking away with. I, mm. You know, for me, I'm going to say that like with the world of megachurch pastors that seem to be falling everywhere mm-hmm. um, and they seem to be falling because of this pride. They seem to be falling because it looked like they had everything together, but turns out there was this secret thing that no one knew about. Mm -hmm. Uh, They had all of this strength that they were posturing, uh, but actually there was this weakness that they weren't willing to embrace. Um, They they looked like they had all of their theology together, but actually turns out they're not even Christian. They doubt and don't believe the Christian message whatsoever. Um, And and what happens is instead of inviting people in to see what we're suffering, and to be fair, a lot of those cultures would not have tolerated that culture. They would not have tolerated that weakness and would have outed them. If if they knew that you were doubting in this area, they would have outed them. But the thing is, as a, as a community of Christians, we actually have to be different in the world. Yes. We actually have to embrace people who are suffering, embrace people who are weak in areas and actually mourn well and suffer well with Christians. And we have to recreate a culture um, that really is very foreign to the Christian industrial complex that we've built. Um, but it needs some mass repentance. This isn't going to take place overnight. Um, it's going to be a lifestyle of weakness yeah. um, on display. Uh, anyway, your thoughts? My thoughts. Okay, two. First thought is, I want to speak to the to the culture of the pulpit and the culture of the church and the culture of the pew. So first, the culture of the pulpit. Ministry culture, guys. For anyone in ministry, I encourage you. You know your weakness. If you don't, if you're that guy who who is honestly naturally talented in so many areas, things come easy to you. You just you just do this stuff and it just flows out of you and everything seems very easy. You're in danger. You're probably in the greatest danger. And the elders, you should you should admit this to your elders and your elders should make room for you to be on your face praying more than most pastors because you need to stay weak before the Lord. Because even though the Lord has granted you much natural ability, that can easily become the greatest hindrance and could take your ministry away from you. So I encourage you and I encourage your elders, give give that man time to pray a lot. And here's the thing, that prayer can't do anything but help your ministry. Now, for people in the pew, if you're saying to yourself, oh, yeah, I know my weaknesses every day. I know uh, both the things I'm pro- tempted towards, and I also know the things I'm just not good at. I have total inability at. Um, I get that. I get that more than most. But I can tell you right now that dependence is not a formula. It's a friendship. So at the end of the day, how you understand and how you work out that dependence with God where that day-to-day, moment-to-moment life of dependence, the way that plays out in your life is between you and Jesus, and you've got to find out yourself. It's going to take personal work of knowing yourself and knowing God through the cross. And in doing that, you will come to a place where you have to be more sacrificial, where you're going to have to embrace your weaknesses. But in there, you're going to find a dependence with God 
that is glorious and fun. And the best part is you'll have a friendship that Josh, you will be able to go through most anything. And I believe we're coming to a day where we need to be able to go through most anything and still um, be Christian at the end of the day. (laughs) That's right. I've got this quote that I'm going to pull up. Um, I'm going to pull it up. It's from D.A. Carson, which kind of outgo on this this uh, piece of homework assignment that Dawson gave me. I posted on Facebook here. Um, we, increase, we increasingly inhabit a time and a place in Western history when humility is perceived to be a sign of weakness, when weakness is taken as a vice, not a virtue, when, when puff is more important than substance, when leadership, uh, even in the church, frequently has more to do with politics, pizzazz, and showmanship or with the structure of hierarchy than with spiritual maturity conformity, and the conformity of Jesus Christ. When the budget is thought to be more important and a more important indicator of ecclesiological success than prayerfulness, and when loose talk of spiritual experience wins an instant following, even when the talk is uh, mingled with s- scarcely concealed haughtiness uh, that has learned neither humility nor tears. That's like the opening chapter of the book that you recommended by yeah, uh, D.A. Carson. Uh, savage, very, very well written. Uh, and, and frankly, just an apt description. Right now, we, we've we got a lot to do. The, the church right now looks a lot like the world, and we've got to push back pretty hard. Um, but don't get me wrong. There are a lot of things in political spaces that have a very Christocentric message. But a lot of the times, what I feel right now is that we are confusing Western political conservatism with the gospel. And I think that that as a church, we need to be Christians first. Um, that made this whole thing political. No one ever heard what we said at the beginning of it. It's a stumbling block for everyone who listened, but that's okay. Um, yeah, I, I feel pretty conservative so I'll, I'll just kind of let the chips fall where they may anyway uh blessings guys thank you so much for tuning in this episode of remnant radio G- give give a uh why don't you have dawson more often in the comment sections for all of you that are tech that i keep talking to michael and michael when this guy exists uh go ahead and drop that into the comments of the video hey, michael chastise rocks. michael and michael for uh, for, you know, not being this, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but seriously though, uh, thank you so much for tuning into this episode. If you feel blessed by, blessed by Dawson, go check him out uh, on the blogs, uh, on remnant radio. There's also a study guide, uh, an archive of study guides. We have at the top of the website there. Uh, and in addition to that, we're entirely crowdfunded. So if you've been blessed by the ministry, you can give there on Patreon. <laughs> As low as five bucks a month, you can That's give so ironic. Uh, to support what we're doing. If you believe in what we're doing, you want to help us. We actually want to empower more people to film with us, to yes. produce content like this. Uh, it's not cheap. It's not free. And it helps us take care of our family so yeah. that we have free time to entertain you. Not to entertain you, to whip you. See, if I put the spiritual spin on it, it sounds better. I like it when I talk about it. When Dawson talks about it, it's not so good. Anyway, <laughs> blessings, guys. We'll see you next time. See you. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode of Remnant Radio. Uh, If you like this video, we actually put together a playlist that has a whole bunch of content just like what is in this video. So I hope you enjoy. And if you got a little bit of extra spare time, maybe check out some of those other videos.